Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rachel Savasic Luxton. I'm the Director of Research and Training here at the Dibble Institute, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to today's webinar, Stretching Grant Dollars and Expanding Reach, Teachers as Facilitators of Healthy Relationship Programming. We're honored and thrilled to have Sarah Simister here to discuss new ways to build relationships and partnerships to support the great work that you are doing in your communities. I'll introduce Sarah here in just a moment, but before we do, there are just a couple of housekeeping things to go over. If you are having a hard time hearing us, the email invitation that you got provides a phone number that you can use to call in and access the audio for today's session. Um, if there is anything else technically wrong, you can sign out and log in, um, as that usually kind of solves the issue. It's the usual thing we do when technology doesn't work, you hit the restart button. Um, we will be having you ask questions utilizing the question box in the control panel. We'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this session for question and answers. Um, and just so everyone knows, there will be a recording of this session, including the slides that will be posted several days after the webinar and a link will be sent out to you with that access information. So before we get into introducing Sarah, I wanna give you a little bit of background about the Dibble Institute for any of you who may be newer to us and wondering how we, we got our name. So on this slide here, you'll see a picture of Charlie and Helen Dibble, and they are the founders of the Dibble Institute. Charlie did a lot of work with youth during his retirement, and he saw a lot of them having difficulties around their relationships or when their parents were having difficulties with their relationships, how that impacted the children. So Charlie had the brilliant idea to translate research into teaching tools that could then be made widely available to young people. The Dibble Institute is not a direct service provider, rather we develop research-based practices and then make them available to people and organizations like you all on today's session. So a little bit about our reach. We are a national independent nonprofit organization. We have clients in all 50 states who are providing direct services and last year, based on our very conservative estimates, we believed our clients reached over 115,000 youth just based on the materials that they purchased. So with that being said, we're really grateful to all of you who are doing this important work with young people. So thank you um, for doing the work that you do. So uh, another little bit about us is our mission um, as that really guides the work that we do. As our mission is to help young people successfully navigate their intimate relationships through um, important information to help build their knowledge around relationship building and other skills-based practices. We know that having these conversations with them pulls a lot of levers. So that's pregnancy prevention, dating violence prevention, mental health, job readiness, and so much more. And in addition to our mission guiding the work that we do, we have a couple of core values. One of those is that we are big believers in research. All of our programs are research-based and we strive for evaluations for our programs to demonstrate their impact and their effectiveness. And with this, that also means that updates are made to our programs as we learn more information. Um, so just keep your eyes out for, for those updates when they become available. Another core value of ours is that we believe in safe, stable, and healthy or nurturing families of all different formations. And this is our goal for young people. We want them to be raised in these family environments. And lastly, we believe that relationship education is for everyone. All of us can improve our relationships and we make sure that our programs are reflective of that and um, that anyone who attends a program or participates in a program feels included and represented. So that's enough about the Devil Institute. You all are here to um, hear from our wonderful, fantastic speaker, Sarah. So I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Sarah. Sarah Simister has worked in the nonprofit sector for nearly a decade. She's worked for Social Innovation Lab for two and a half years, and she's the director of Positive Youth Development Programs. She earned her master's in history from the University of Texas, San Antonio, and um, her master's in nonprofit management from Our Lady of the Lake University, which is also in San Antonio. She has experience as a program facilitator, offering healthy sexuality and life skills programs in schools. And her current role with the organization involves research and grant writing and award management. On a more personal note, you know, Sarah is really passionate about helping youth get the best start to their adult lives that they possibly can. In her spare time, she also loves bird watching, um, perfecting her multitasking skills by simultaneously 
watching TV while staring at her phone, which I think is something we can all probably relate to, and going to concerts. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Sarah to talk to you about stretching your grant dollars. Thank you, Rachel, for the lovely introduction. And thank you all for joining me. Uh, and thanks to the Dibble Institute for having me today. Uh, I am delighted to be here. So uh, you all are here to talk about stretching grant dollars and expanding reach of your programs. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you all about that. Next slide, please. So we're gonna cover some different topics. Uh, we're gonna talk about my organization a little bit. Um, you'll learn about our projects uh, testing this model, uh, why we believe teachers are a great resource uh, where to start if you would like to uh, start a program like this, and then we'll recap it at the end. So next slide, please. That's me, I am Sarah Simister, again, Director of Positive Youth Development Programs. I work for Social Innovation Lab. Uh, before I share a little bit about my organization, I would really like to tell you that all of the projects we are going to talk about today are funded by Health and Human Services, uh, the Administration for Children and Families, and Family and Youth Services Bureau, uh, or FISB, as you may know them. So next slide, please. A little bit about our programs and about our organization. Um, SIL is a nonprofit org. We dedicate ourselves to improving social programs. Um, we, to evaluate, we conduct evaluations. Uh, we share the information much in this manner uh, and in peer-reviewed articles uh, to help improve the programs that are being offered through organizations throughout the nation. Uh, these are just a few logos from a few of the things we do. Uh, we do have a suicide prevention arm of our services. Uh, we do food scarcity. We work with AmeriCorps. And uh, we even did some stuff for uh, fighting the coronavirus in uh, 2020 and 2021. So next slide, please. But today we're gonna to focus on our teen pregnancy prevention projects or adolescent pregnancy prevention projects. Uh, so far we've had three of them funded. Uh, we call these the Better Futures projects. Um, we've had two of them in Kansas. Our first one was in 2018. Uh, it had closed in 2020, so it was only two years, is the KBFEP. Uh, the Oklahoma, the OKBFP uh, started in 2019. It was for three years. It will be closing this year. Uh, both of those projects are sexual risk avoidance projects. Um, our last one that was just funded this past year uh, is a prep project, and we call it our K prep project. Uh, and it is funded for three more years. So, next slide, please. Now, we can't do this without our partners. So, we partner with the FCCLA Foundation in both Oklahoma and Kansas. That is a student-led organization uh, that works with family and consumer science students and teachers. And we also work with Oklahoma Career Tech. They also work with family and consumer science teachers who were the teachers that we worked with in these projects. Um, of course, the Dibble Institute, they supply all of our curriculum, all of our training, and all of our supplies, pardon me, and then also our evaluation partner, Midwest Evaluation and Research. Uh, they are located in Emporia, Kansas, and um, we partner with them on all of our projects as well. Next slide, please. Just to give you a bird's eye view of those projects, they, like I mentioned, they began in 2014, so that's four years of programming. Uh, we have been awarded through 2024, uh, through all of those projects, uh, $1.6 million to put towards our programs. We will um, be talking about cost in a little bit. Over the four years, we have managed to serve 2,613 students. Um, it's a little bit lower than we had anticipated because COVID disruption, but it's still a great number. Uh, we have trained through Dibble, uh, 93 family and consumer science teacher participants. Because while the students are our target, the teachers are the participants in our project. So, next slide, please. A little bit about our project design. We wanted to engage family and consumer science teachers. We wanted to engage them because they were already teaching the subject matter in their classes. 
um, and we engaged directly with the teachers. The teachers were responsible for getting permission to bring our project into their schools. So it cut out that idea that you have to deal with the administration. You're really there to answer questions. Um, we did matching and pre-post surveys as part of our design. Uh, we asked the student participants uh, you know, for some matching identifiers, first initial, last initial, that kind of stuff. And we wanted to see if the teachers were as effective as outside facilitators in delivering healthy relationship curriculum. And we determined that um, it would buy whether it was an effective program and whether we saw the rate of change in the students that were taking the program um, that, we would, that were seen in the evaluation of outside facilitators. And then we asked the teachers, for monthly performance measures. Uh, they just things like how the program's going, they, if they provided any referrals, and then the time spent. So we knew uh, the dosage of at each student and how much they got of love notes. Uh, and then we collect attendance for the same reason. So we did design this project with a few assumptions in mind. Uh, students will already be in the classrooms. Um, so we they will stay and they will finish. Um, is the idea. Uh, teachers will continue to use the curriculum after. Uh, so sustainability is a big part of our project and that they are as effective as outside facilitators in delivering EVPs. So those are assumptions going in. Um, and here's what we got. Next slide, please. All right, those are our delivery models. I couldn't pass up this picture of the youth facilitator empowering the youth. Um, because, you know, youth facilitators are so cool. Uh, I, was, I was a facilitator and I was amazing. <laughs> uh, but we have our two delivery models. We have not evaluated the outside facilitator model yet. What we've done is used data from previous evaluations of EVPs and compared them to our teachers as facilitator model. Um, we are still collecting data. The projects have not wrapped up, so we don't have a complete uh, project yet, but we will eventually. Uh, next slide, please. So there are pros and cons to both the uh, teachers and facilitators. Uh, facilitators, like I mentioned, young, hip, cool, they come into school, fresh perspectives. They're a face your students don't see all the time. Uh, your students may feel free to ask questions of a facilitator. They wouldn't be embarrassed to ask a teacher or a counselor because they see them all the time. Um, so there, there are really great um, positives to bringing in outside facilitators. However, because you are an outside facilitator, there are some cons. You can struggle to get information from the school. The school may not cooperate in giving you information. Um, you're only there for a few days, so you don't have the opportunity to build up a relationship uh, with the students. You have that rapport built with them, you provide them with their ABP, and then you leave. Um, and then if there is a snow day, your day is gone. Uh, teachers, on the other hand, can bounce around that kind of stuff. So um, teachers, they already have those existing relationships with their students. They understand their communities. They understand their families. They know the, what the needs are. Um, and again, sustainability is a big part of this project. Now, when we talk about facilitation versus teaching on both sides, there are pros and cons. Teaching is a little bit of participation from the students, but mostly it's the teacher and up at the front of the room. Facilitation is the learning happens in the group. So the facilitators are offering um, prompts for the conversation. They're offering information and then they ask the students to discuss. Um, provide answers. Teachers have a hard time doing that because they're teachers. Um, so it's something you have to watch out for and can be a con uh, and depending on what you're looking for in your program. So next slide, please. These are our project inputs. Again, family and consumer science teachers. Family and consumer science teachers are um, what home ec teachers were 30 years ago uh, when I was in high school. Um, but it's much more these days. They do uh, family planning, they do um, financial planning, they teach kids how to make budgets. It's really life skills. It should be a required class for everybody in my opinion, um, but it is still an elective class. 
And again, we chose family and consumer science teachers because they are already teaching relationship curriculum. Now, that kind of curriculum can work in a variety of classes. It can work in health classes. It can work with counselors. Um, it's really up to you. And we're going to talk more about how to establish a, um, a program in your community in a little bit. Our project inputs were the Dibble curriculum. We used the Love Notes SRA version uh, for both our first Kansas and our Oklahoma project. The new prep project, we're using Love Notes EVP. And we only used Relationship Smarts for middle school students in Oklahoma. Uh, we had far more high school students than we did um, middle school students. And as far as our target audience, um, we were looking in rural communities, rural communities that are shrinking all over Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, lucky for us, over 80% of both of those states are rural. Um, and, you know, when populations shrink, people leave, so do resources. So it really is an underserved population. A lot of population centers in larger cities are saturated with nonprofits and organizations. Um, so it, if you're looking to build a program, rural communities are a really great way to do it. Um, and access to them, I mean, you can't have a facilitator drive across the state every day. So uh, teachers are a really great access point. Uh, we did want to work in counties that had higher teen pregnancy rates uh, than the national average. And uh, initially we were looking for free and reduced uh, lunch rates, but in the pandemic, everyone uh, got free and reduced lunch. Uh, that's ending, I believe, the school year, which is unfortunate, uh, but it wasn't really relevant the past couple of years. Uh, and then we wanted to make sure they had a fax program. We wanted to make sure that they had a teacher that we could you know, work with. So uh, next slide, please. So we based on the theory of change. Um, it came, the theory of change is informed by a variety of different other theories, um, but it, it talks, it, it says these four primary factors influence how youth is going to behave. Now, again, it's a theory. It's what we're putting to the test. Um, and as you can see by the percentages, um, about half of the students, and that seemed to be on everything, about half of the students improved uh, at the end of their program. So do, are they going to delay sexual activity? Um, do they feel they have more knowledge about sexual risk avoidance? Um, can, that includes consent. Um, do they feel it was the program effective in modifying their attitudes and beliefs? And what, could they increase the skills of related to sexual risk avoidance? Yes, we half is a good number. It's never like, of course, 100% would be ideal, but half is what we've got. So it's it's a really good number when in terms of improvement. So um, next slide, please. All right. Um, you'll never hear me say, except for this moment, let's do some math. I was very excited when I made the slide um, because as much as I dislike math, um, I understand its usefulness and I do enjoy data as long as I don't have to do the work. Um, but I did do the work on this. So uh, next slide, please. I wanted to talk about how this is such a cost effective program. So I mentioned the $1.6 million earlier, and that is what we have been awarded. That is by no means what we have expended. Um, we, we were able to serve four years of programming, 2,600 students, and train 93 teachers, and these were our expenditures, just a little over $200,000, about $225,000 um, over four years. So I did a little fun experiment. Next slide, please. Like <laughs> math problems, who doesn't love them? So I took, I divided everything by four. I took the average for our year, including our number of students. So on average per year, and these are startup costs because your startup costs in this program are only going to be from the training. Everything else is just continued costs, but your startup costs are going to be more as an program. Um, Came out to about $56,000 a year, a little over that. Uh, the 650 students, again, that's over four years, 2,600 divided by four comes about 655, I think. Anyway, we spent about $87 per student in all of our projects to start this up. Um, to make a point, next slide, please. 
I made a hypothetical. <laughs> so let's say you're an organization who wants to do a new healthy relationship program in your community. You know your community needs it. You want to do it in schools. Um, here are, you know, you want to have to hire outside facilitators. Um, all of that cost comes with it. So let's say you are hiring um, your outside facilitators. Your employment costs just to employ for a program like this is going to be $44,000 just for the training and the hours they work, not for everything else, um, not for if they're working other programs. This is just for, say, they put 40 hours into the program and prep and training, and this is worth 40 hours of work. So I added all of those things up. It's about 68,000 uh, a year. So you're spending $105 per student. Next slide, please. So if you serve 650 students and you use teachers, you're gonna save almost $12,000 from one model to the other that your continued cost for the student is $15.50 per student. And that are your work, those are your workbook costs. It doesn't include any sort of incentives. It doesn't include anything. And by the way, we incentivize all of the teachers and the students to participate in our project. And that was included in our original costs. So teachers got stipends, students got gift cards, and all of that was included. So you wanna serve another 650 students for the second year, you spend $10,000, you still have $1,600 left over and you provided two years of programming. And that's a pretty good deal in my opinion. So the cost effectiveness wasn't the goal of our project, but it's a, something that came out of it. Um, and now we know how cost effective teachers really are. Next slide, please. Our sustainability question. Um, we are still working on that. We don't. We haven't been away from our projects long enough to gather that data. But we want to know if teachers are still continuing to use Love Notes or components of Love Notes as we move forward without federal funding. Um, at the end of each of our projects, we have purchased uh, student workbooks to help with sustainability for the next couple of semesters. Um, but as soon, in probably about two years, we'll start to look back and start to work with the teachers again and ask them, hey, are you still using that? So it's still a question, but our assumption is yes, it is still a sustainable pro um, project or program. Next slide, please. So in our preliminary evaluation of the Better Futures project, we know it's an effective program, we know it's cost effective, but it does warrant further research. So we know that having teachers in schools um, or in teaching uh, EVPs, healthy relationship uh, EVPs in schools is a good model and just as good as outside facilitators. Next slide, please. I hope I didn't lose anyone in the math. Um, I'm missing a, there we go. <laughs> I was like, I'm missing a slide. Um, like every model, like I mentioned, there are advantages, the low cost delivery, high startup costs, low continued costs. Um, if you are working in schools and you have other programs you would like to promote, you have a built-in promoter. <laughs> you have a teacher who's working with your organization and enjoys working with you, um, and they can promote your programs. Uh, you're going to reach a larger number of students because they're in schools. I don't know if you'll reach a larger number of students because fax classes tend to be pretty small, um, but we also have students that are completing. As in community programs, it's hard to get students to come back all the time or youth to continue to come. There's all sorts of barriers to coming to a community center um, and that kind of stuff. So when you want to have dosage, you want kids to you know, complete at least 75% of the curriculum, schools are a great way to go. Um, again, teachers can just roll with the punches in schools. If it's a snow day, they have a plan in place. So um, it's easy for them to uh, move things around. They're employed by the school. Yeah, you don't have to contract with them. You don't have to pay their employment insurance or their you know, health insurance or anything. They're employed by the school. 
Um, so no responsibility there other than what you've promised in your program or project. Um, again, sustainability, we, yeah, we think it's going to be a big thing. Um, they already have those developed relationships with students and families. And again, they're already teaching the content. Um, but with all programs and projects come barriers. So next slide, please. Pardon me, reporting issues. Um, teachers are wonderful resources. Teachers are wonderful. I would never say anything terrible about a teacher um, because they're just amazing. Uh, but getting paperwork is difficult. <laughs> um, uh, we have had, uh, and it's just because they're so busy and we understand that. So we try to be as kind as possible. We do gentle nudge reminders via email. Hey, we need your attendance. Um, hey, we need your monthly performance measure surveys. Um, so you can expect that um, if you choose this model. Uh, access to classrooms for observations. Um, access to classrooms at all in today's post, I use that word uh, loosely, pandemic world and uh, you know security and stuff, it's gonna be difficult anyway. Uh, but we have put all of our observations on Zoom uh, so we are not in the classroom. We're just on a Zoom call with teachers. So it does work, uh, but still access to classrooms for anything is tough. Timing. You, you have to recruit teachers at the right time. Um, if you want teachers to, you want to bring in a curriculum into their classrooms, um, you have to catch them at the right time because their curriculums and lesson plans are complete months in advance. Uh, you know, they just don't say, hey, this is great. Um, and I'm sure you all have worked with schools or are in schools, so you understand that, but uh, you have to find timing, the, the, you have to time it just right. Um, fidelity issues. If you are running a project, um, like our prep project, it is uh, based on fidelity and all of our projects have fidelity um, observations done. Um, but teachers may change activities or the order of things, and it's things we have to be aware of. Uh, you can tell them all day long that they need to do from, you know, A to Z. But again, they're used to rolling with the punches. They have to move things around a lot. Um, so it could be an issue. Uh, survey collection, same thing. Um, we run projects that require surveys. We need to, we won't have any data if we don't have surveys. Our funders require surveys. Um, and it might not be the most important thing, you know, as uh, my old boss told me, whatever, you know, is most important to you is probably not the most important thing to the other person you're asking it for. So, um, yeah, that might be an issue. Uh, teaching versus facilitation, we already covered that. Um, lots of guiding the class instead of saying like, hey, you go on your own. Um, in different schools, different teachers, different roles. Everything is different in every school. And we're gonna talk about that more as we go on. Um, why teachers? Next slide, please. Because we believe it's a sustainable project or we uh, program. We know it's cost effective. We've proven that. And uh, it's you have an expanded reach because your students are in those classrooms and they're going to continue to come to classrooms. So next slide, please. <laughs> Where would you start um, if you are interested in doing something like this? So. Um, the starting line and naturally next slide please every good project and program begins with research um, you may already have a lot of these things done uh, needs assessment for the project you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a need uh, it's also a great argument <laughs> to schools or to teachers if they're not interested hey we wouldn't be here if you didn't need us um, you want to explore the available curricula. Like I mentioned, Dibble has wonderful curriculum available, uh, in healthy relationships in uh, financial literacy. Um, they have Mind Matters. Uh, they have all sorts of different stuff. But there are a billion curricula out there um, to choose from. So uh, you want to search for compatible class topics. Again, we chose FACTS teachers because we know that they're already teaching healthy relationship program uh, and curriculum. And we want to enhance that. We want to supplement that. Um, and uh, but health classes are another good one. Uh, like I mentioned, counselors, they're good uh, for training and these kind of things. Um, so it's just whatever uh, you choose, whatever's best for your organization and your community. 
and whatever will work best for you. And once you figure that out, then you'll have to look for the state standards for all the grades, and that will also help you in the curricula search. Um, you know, you need something that will uh, comply with the state standards, um, and Dibble makes a great job, does a great job of making that argument for you. Uh, they will uh, show you everything you need to make sure, to show how it uh, love notes goes along with the state standards of facts. Um, you are I. I would take stock of existing relationships or connections at this point. Um, it's all about who you know, we know that. Uh, so getting into schools, cold calling places isn't really effective. Um, so I would take stock of those relationships in, at the beginning. And then grant opportunities, funding is always an issue, um, but I'm gonna talk about those two things here in just a second. So next slide, please. The biggest part of this running a project through your schools is um, relationship building. You're gonna have to build your team. Uh, you're gonna leverage those existing relationships. And if they were just connections, you're gonna have to nurture them into relationships um, because it's the best way to get things done. And if you're able to do that and you're able to show funders you have a team set up, you're able to show schools you have a team set up, um, you know, they're, it just really speaks volumes for your organization if you're able to do that. Look for teachers who are dedicated to the subject matter. You may think that you're gonna run out there and you know, yell and be like, free curriculum for teachers, and they'll come running, and that is not the truth. Um, it is very difficult to get teachers involved. I will not sugarcoat that. Um, they have a lot going on. They already have a lot to do. So you have to make it a really tempting offer. Um, and we're still working on that. Um, we sometimes get a rush of teachers and sometimes we don't, but you wanna look for teachers who are dedicated to delivering this topic. Um, curriculum coordinators in schools could be your best friends. Those are the people who are deciding what is going into classrooms. Um, find one, <laughs> find someone who knows one. Uh, they are the ones who really make decisions in, in school districts. And then the teacher or student organizations in the subject area. Like I mentioned, we work with the family, uh, the FCCLA, uh, which is a student-led organization. Uh, the Career Tech, which is for teachers, but it's their career pathways. Um, so those are really great ends uh, with teachers if you don't want to start with schools directly. Um, so next slide, please. But speaking of working with schools, um, I, again, I know that a lot of you are program facilitators. You're, uh, I don't know if you're in schools or if you've already done this, um, but if you haven't, um, not all schools are alike. <laughs> so um, every school is different. Like I mentioned, different schools, different teachers, different roles, different districts. You have state standards, for example, here in Kansas, we have state standards for um, sex education here, but they stop, they're pretty short of dictating anything other than the fact that they're required, leaving school districts to make those decisions of what kind of sex ed they're putting into their schools. So your state may have something very similar to that, um, just leaving school districts to figure it out, and that's not consistent education. Um, and that's what we're trying to do is create a consistent program. But um, yeah, they're not all alike. They're all making different decisions. They're all working differently. Uh, you have to be flexible when working with schools. Um, they may say, hey, you can come in next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they email you on Friday and say, that's not gonna work. We have other things to do. So you just gotta roll with that one. Um, and show that you're communicating with parents and guardians. It's a must. Uh, it is a must. <laughs> you need to, you need to let parents and guardians know that their students are participating in something. Um, we send home what are called opt out letters. We use pass passive consent. Um, and if the parents don't want students to participate, they sign something and they send it back. Otherwise, we've done our due diligence. We've sent them a letter. We've you know they have the information. Um, to provide you with a little extra, there is a link in your handouts, I believe, 
Um, thank you for putting that there, Esther. Uh, it is for, uh, it's just a, it's like a 60 page document. It's very long and it was done in 2014. So it's kind of dated, but it gives you an idea of how to work with schools and uh, how schools work. So it's a pretty good uh, um, handout. And it's the National Association of School Boards of Education. So I kind of think they know what they're talking about. So um, next slide, please. All right, funding. This is a very important thing. What's attractive about this model? Um, so we talked about reach. And so your kids are already in classrooms. They're likely to continue coming. They're likely to complete the program. Um, we're talking supplemental learning. You are supplementing in schools. Um, you are bringing in brand new quality evidence-based education. Uh, sustainability, the idea is that once a teacher is trained and once these little kids get into high school, they also have the same access. Um, and then data, funders love data. Um, so collecting surveys, uh, doing that kind of stuff, reporting your needs, um, your description of your problem, that kind of stuff. So uh, you have all of those things in a model like this. Uh, you can find funding at grants.gov, uh, federal funding there. That's again, where we have been funded. Uh, foundation Center, Grant Station, check your um, area foundations, corporations. Um, yeah, the S went down to the bottom, not sure why. But uh, those are all different places that you can look for funding for something like this. Next slide, please. Navigating a volatile climate. This is probably my favorite slide. So we've done all of these things. Um, you know, we talked about cost and everything, but I'm gonna be real honest with you about what it's like to try to recruit in schools right now with healthy, healthy relationship curriculum. <laughs> um, if you are stuck in a situation, uh, we have had administrators say that they don't want to bring in a curriculum that could land them on the front page of the newspaper. Um, we've had teachers say our community will just not go for this. And that's when you got to really know your curriculum and you got to say, hey, um, that's not what this is about. <laughs> uh, and you can show them examples of what the curriculum really is about. Uh, and work with curriculum developers at that point. I know I reached out to Dibble and I said, hey, I've got two administrators. I want to see copies of the entire teacher's manual. What do I do? And uh, they sent me uh, access to two copies uh, for administrators to look through. And we ended up getting those teachers, I think. So uh, that's really great. You, you're going to run into these issues. Um, more so now than ever, because we never ran into them until this year. Um, share your needs assessment with your schools uh, that you're going to or your teachers or whomever. That's really powerful stuff. You've done the work. You have the data. You show like, hey, you know, 28 out of 1,000 young girls in this county are getting pregnant. You know, girls between the ages of 14 and 19. Like, we obviously need something. Um, so share that kind of stuff that it's really powerful. Um, anything that happens in your program, you want to resolve at the school level. Um, you do not want it to go higher than that. Uh, and when I talk about uh, issues, we had in one of our programs, a during a virtual learning session, because we did a lot of those, we had a parent who was upset by one word in one sentence that was taken out of context. And it had to do with um, same-sex couples. Um, and somehow, some way, a state representative found out um, and tried to politicize it and wanted lists of our schools that were partic participating and uh, things like that. Do not turn over that kind of confidential information. Um, but uh, luckily it just kind of fizzled out, but we had resolved, we thought we had resolved it at the school level and it made its way up. But you really want things to be done there. Um, and sometimes you could just gotta take the no and move on. Um, but you know, if you're approaching someone who looks like this little kid here, uh, you know, just do your best. <laughs> but 
just be aware that when you start to go out and look for places, schools to take this on, um, you could find some backlash for that. So, um, or you could receive some backlash, excuse me. All right, next slide, please. So just to recap, we saved $18 per student with our fun math problems earlier. Um, and that's an estimated, remember I'm a trained historian, I don't know if you caught that at the beginning, um, but I do love, uh, do love data and sometimes math. Um, but that's our estimated money saved by working uh, with teachers as facilitators. Um, and again, you'll be working, you'll be reaching youth with consistent programming. Uh, they will complete it um, and they will have access to their teachers afterwards. Um, program sustainability, it's very important. It's something that we look for um, and we hope your programs look for as well. Uh, data collection, it's a really great opportunity for data collection. It's a great opportunity for comparison data as well. Um, and new models can be really appealing to dynamic funders. Um, if you show them a new model and you've got this and you've already got partnerships in place, uh, funding is pretty inevitable. So um, best of luck with that. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Just a few resources. We can kind of, you can look at this later. Next slide. All right. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, I hope I covered some information that you um, are really interested in. Um, but are there any questions? Yeah, you did such a great job. Every time I had a question that I was writing down, I feel like the next sentence you'd provide the answer. So oh. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get everyone. I know sometimes people kind of wait until the end and then the questions start to flood in versus mm -hmm. um, looking as we go throughout. So I'm going to go ahead, I guess, maybe and pose one of my questions while they go ahead and um, we give them the time and the space to submit theirs. So, um, you know, I heard you say, some of the things were like catching the teachers at the right time and having mm -hmm. you know, teachers that are dedicated to the subject matter. I was just wondering, I think you, you touched a little bit too on some incentives or ways to convince teachers, but what are some incentives or ways that you've kind of encouraged buy-in from these educators that have been fruitful for you? Well, um, yeah, great question, thank you. Um, through our projects, we have offered stipends, uh, monetary stipends to all the teachers who participated. Uh, that gets a pretty good buy-in. Um, initially, we had tied those stipends to grants, like they had to fill out a grant and do all this stuff. And eventually we were like, never mind, <laughs> just take the money. Um, so mo money works. Uh, the access to free curriculum and free training. Um, and if you provide the the uh, workbooks. Again, the continued cost isn't a lot to sustain a program for an organization that, like a nonprofit that offers, you know, youth programming. Um, to get the uh, students involved in our surveys, we gave them gift cards at each survey collection. Um, but that is something you don't have to do. Kids love swag. <laughs> they love pencils and pens and everything you can give them. Um, but as far as teachers, money really worked and access to free curriculum and access to Dibble. Um, they couldn't have had access to Dibble. Um, and that includes, you know, updated trainings, uh, TA, anything like that. Uh, we provide that for them. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And with the, um, the, the financial piece, too, uh, you know, I've heard other mm -hmm. people in different ways. Is it um, like a per student or per semester? Or how do you know? What are some ways that you've done that that's worked? Um, are you asking how we budgeted for it or how we paid for it? Or? Well, I guess how you said that like um, you could you would like pay some of the teachers to implement the was it to implement the program or like a per student met? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, thank you. Um, no, it was per class or no, per semester. I'm sorry. Um, so we gave them one stipend per semester. So whether they had one class or three classes, um, I have worked when I was an outside facilitator um, in San Antonio. I we got twenty five dollars per student. 
Um, so it could be, it's a different model works for different people. Um, organizations really like the $25 per student um, because it's just a more accurate count. Um, mm -hmm. But also if you're the one paying it out and they had, you know, a whole bunch of students <laughs> that cost you way more than $500. So it's really up to the organization. Um, but it was paid out every semester. Um, so teachers could earn up to $1,000 per academic year. Wow. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we're still, well, there's a question, and I guess this, it, it, you know, can be posed to you, and it's something that Dibble can answer as well. Um, and it, I think it goes to with some of the delivery questions that I had for, you know, your educators. I know you talked a lot about being flexible with mm -hmm. how they are, are implementing. Um, do you know kind of a little bit about their delivery plan in terms of do they split it up over the semester and about how long on average are they dedicating to the programs that they're implementing? Yeah. That's a great question. I didn't address it in the, um, I should add that in there. <laughs> so remember I said different teachers, different schools, different rules, that kind of stuff. Every teacher is different. Uh, yeah, <laughs> every teacher is different. I had, I, I just this week put in all of our performance measure reportings for SRAE and prep. So I saw all of our cohorts and how many hours they spent. I had some teachers who were like 15 hours, we're done. I had some teachers who were like 36 hours. Um, it really depends on the teacher. And that's another thing you're gonna get with outside facilitators, it's gonna be consistent. You've got six 45 minute, you know, lessons, you're doing six 45 minute lessons. With teachers, they're like, man, this discussion went on, we can drag it on for three months. <laughs> um, and that's so it really, I mean, that's a, a pro and a con, really, because if you just want them to finish the project. Um, but if they're taking forever with it, they're saturating their kids with it. Um, so it's a very, it's, it, it could go either way. Teachers, their lesson plans, um, they vary widely. So, but we do ask when they start a semester, they complete a semester. Um, we were uh, much more flexible the past couple years due to COVID um, because some teachers would start in the fall and then they wouldn't be able to finish till, you know, January or so. Um, but it, we try to stick to the semester. But gotcha. yeah, it just depends. <laughs> I, I know. I was like, when you, of course, you said the schools, you know, every every place varies. But I was like, if we can get like mm -hmm. an option of what your hopes are. Um, so a, another question has come in, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, yeah. They asked about the training, so they were wondering if trainers were trained before your teachers were provided training. So do you want to talk a little bit about the training? Absolutely. Um, we do not have trainers. Um, in our organization, we rely on Dibble to provide our training for us, master trainers. Um, so we pay them a fee. Uh, we've done virtual trainings with them. They have been fantastic. Um, as a matter of fact, most of our trainings have been virtual. Uh, we had two in person before, maybe two or three before COVID, and we haven't had one since <laughs> that's not uh, in person. Um, I'm sure that Dibble offers a train the trainer, and I know you do, um, right, on this. So you can train trainers, uh, but we use our teachers because we're not employing facilitators. Our facilitators would be the ones who would be trained. We'd pick a couple of them, they'd be our trainers. Um, so since we're not employing them, uh, we just we rely on Dibble for that. So it's another cost cutting thing that you can do. So yes, we do provide um, training and offer training. So I see some of the questions were, who were the trainers? They are um, Dibble certified trainers. They are employed by our organization. And um, for our virtual trainings, you have at least two trainers per training session. And those trainers may vary based on availability. Um, so I know you've had a couple of different experiences with uh, different trainers of, of ours, but most recently, I think it was Caleb and Jonelle, and I know that there was some really great feedback on the most recent training that- we Oh yeah, our, our teachers love it. And um, it's really great for them when we do virtual trainings because um, you know, they're, they're home in the summer, they don't have to travel anywhere, most of them are parents, um, that kind of stuff. So we're, we wanna 
the thing with working with teachers, and if I part, if I leave anything with you, <laughs> the thing about working with teachers is you really have to cater to their needs. Um, every school is different. We have schools starting this week. We have schools starting next week. We have teachers who went back to school to the school building in the middle of July. You know, it, it just it's hard to pin down. Um, one of my greatest resources in navigating that is I have a retired teacher who works for me um, and who knows the school system and is a retired fax teacher. Um, and she does the recruiting for us and sets up the trainings. Another great idea is what we're doing. Um, we're kind of usurping this statewide training that the teachers have next summer and we're like, hey, because they have options of different workshops. So we're going to take two and a half days of that workshop and pay the fees for all the teachers to go to the workshop. We're going to pay for their training, uh, pay for their food, their lodging, everything. So um, because it's all grant funded. But you find opportunities like that to train is my recommendation. Thank you. It sounds like you all really think through a lot and do a lot to remove those hurdles or barriers for folks so that they can do trainings and then implement, which I'm sure is a, mm -hmm. huge, um, a huge help. So another question, and um, this is interesting, it's kind of on, on par with one of the questions that I had written down, was, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of pushback maybe, and I think you started to get at this, um, from school boards or others kind of in that higher up decision making kind of ranks, if you will, with some of the topics, right? They might have some, some pushback. So what is the best route or what are the routes that you all have taken to help navigate those conversations um, and explaining the, the need for these mm -hmm. topics to be discussed? So one of our like, smoking guns, if you will, <laughs> in recruiting, re getting administrations buy-in is the teacher. Um, we send the teacher to the administration. We don't go to the administration. We are here to support teachers if they have questions, et cetera, um, but we're not the ones who are asking the administration. If they give us like a, you know, just we're not going to do it, then, you know, they're not going to do it. But um, I recommend providing as much information as you can. Like I mentioned, uh, Dibble provided access to a teacher's manual. So you can show them like, hey, we're not inducting, we're not putting the kids in a cult. We're not telling, we're not normalizing teen sex. We're not telling them to go out and make bad decisions. Like it's the polar opposite of all of that. Like independent thought, critical thinking, social emotional learning, all of those things that are essentially required um, in the education system now are presented to you in a nice little three ring binder and we want to bring it to your school. Um, so really, if you have to meet with the administration, um, I would take it that far and be like, you know, send a teacher first. And then if they, if the teacher says, I really need some support, go from there. Um, but again, sometimes administration's like, no, we're not doing it. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> So, but my recommendation is just to have as much information available as possible. Great. So. And I think too, one of the things that you talked about that can be really helpful is showing how you are, are the programs that you're bringing meet the needs and the requirements that they, mm -hmm. you know, or the goals that they're striving to achieve. Mm -hmm. Or maybe some of those, you know, key areas um a concern and how the programs the research like you said the research on the program show that they have an impact on those outcomes um or, or areas of concern or interest for the you know school board or educators or whomever mm -hmm. um a, another question that i think is is very interesting is talking about you, you know you talked about the importance of communicating with the parents and with the guardians of these students that you're working with or that the teachers are working with so what do you think is really important to include in that letter to encourage kind of the parents buy-in as well? So in ours, again, uh, most of our permissions are for surveying the students um, because we do, and if you are federally funded, you will have to do this too. Um, they are required for uh, funding unless you can get an exemption letter, um, which I would, are pretty hard to get, I guess. Um, but anyway, 
Um, you have to mention that you're going to be surveying the students. I would just mention, you know, uh, that they're going to be presented with this curriculum. Um, word it for your community. Sometimes I feel like our, I just mentioned this the other day. I feel that our opt out letter is so technical that like it doesn't get the point across. Um, but be very clear in your language, make it short and sweet and provide contact information. Um, for I, my, my personal phone number <laughs> is on those letters because I work from home. Um, my email's on there. If they have any questions, you be accessible. Um, and that way they can go above the teacher or the teacher can contact you. But the important information is knowing that your kids are gonna be receiving this education. This is why it's important. Again, that needs assessment. Hey, you know, 68 kids got pregnant last year. Like, no. Um, the dates that how the teacher was trained, we have that in there. Um, and that their student has been chosen to participate in this project or program. Um, so, but definitely as much information as you possibly can. Ours are two sided. They have a lot about the survey in front and on the back, they have a complete description of the curriculum. So, um, we have everything you need to know about that, but always have um, an, a way for parents or guardians to ask questions. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. that is that, again, going that extra mile of you're not putting it on the teachers to answer those questions. You're making mm -hmm. yourself available to, um, to the teachers, to the students, to the parents, to the school administration, to um, y'all are really taking on a lot um, to help kind of get these programs moving and utilized so that these, the kids are getting the information that they need. All right, I think we have time for, oh, okay, let's see. I was like, I think we have time for one question, one more question, and then we do. a question pops up, so that works out beautifully. Um, so one of the things you were talking about were, you know, pregnancy rates, and I know you've said that part of the things that you uh, do as being a grant, you collect research um, and data. What are some of the trends that maybe you all have seen since implementing these programs? Is there kind of like a summary? That, you that is have? such a great question. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, <laughs> so as a matter of fact, when we wrote our prep grant uh, that we received last year, so this would have just been last year's research, um, I had contacted our former teachers, found out that almost half of them were continuing um, to do that. So we had a sustainable, you know, program and then also in the count in let's see we had 64 counties with there are 100 okay <laughs> there are 105 counties in kansas um we had 64 of them that qualified uh as in like rural you know or frontier um higher than two pregnancy rates we worked in over 20 of those and when i was writing our prep grant and doing research i noticed that in eight of the 23 we worked in, I think, somewhere around there, um, that their teen pregnancy rates had dropped. Now, I'm not saying that that is directly correlated, but I am saying that that's what I'm seeing. But then again, the national pregnancy rate is dropping every year. Um, another thing that we've noticed is the need for social, emotional, and mental health um, and the requests for that. Um, in, in the counties that we are delivering programs in. Um, but we've also noticed um, that people are moving out from those, uh, our classrooms are shrinking. Um, so that's another thing that's going on too. So those are the only things I can think off the top of my head. Thank you. Well, I will say, you know, we are in all 50 states too. So that, um, <laughs> that there's a correlation there. I'm not saying direct causation, but that's uh, yeah. okay. Interesting correlation. Well, I think so, Sarah, I want to say thank you again so much for taking time out of your yeah. Wednesday to come present and share all this really helpful information for folks who may be trying to figure out a new way um, to extend their reach and, like you said, stretch those grant dollars. So thank you yeah. so much for this. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And if anyone has questions, feel free to email me. Thank, thank you so much. We. Um, 
don't have our next webinar ready to announce just yet. We're keeping it a little, you know, secret for now. So keep an eye out for what's to come. But again, thank you everyone for joining us on today's session. There is going to be a brief survey at the end of this webinar. We really appreciate it if you take the time to provide us some feedback by completing this. It shouldn't take you more than just a couple, you know, a couple minutes. Uh, as a reminder, the webinar will be available in just the next couple of days. You can find it on our archive at the link that you see on your slide here. Again, a link will be emailed out to everyone. So uh, there will be this recording plus the slides available. If you've got any questions about Dibble or about today's webinar or just anything else you want to know about grant dollars, programs, um, and the like, you can email us at relationshipskills at dibbleinstitute.org. And we look forward to hopefully hosting everyone again next month at our monthly webinar. So have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.